Hi, folks. Frank McNally again. Thank you all for joining us and good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. Like I said, I'm Frank McNally from Public Spend Forum. I'm really excited to bring you today's webinar on behalf of Public Spend Forum and NIGP, the Institute for Government Procurement. Joining me today is Raj Sharma, my boss and fearless leader. I'm going to let him introduce himself in just a moment, but I wanted to tell you all real quick what uh, inspired our topic for today. It was a talk that uh, I heard Raj and probably many of you heard him give at the National Contract Management Association's World Congress in Cleveland this past July. It's about becoming a hero and not just any hero, but an information superhero. Uh, we're going to help you get to that level by sharing some of the techniques that we have for conducting efficient and effective government market research. Now, <clears throat> this is part one in a broader series that we're launching here at Public Spend Forum and with NIGP on how to do your best market research ever. So stay tuned to publicspendforum.net and NIGP for information about upcoming events. So our objectives for today, we, you know, we do think information is very critical uh, to conducting your best market research. And wh why is that? Well, for one thing, it's going to help you become more intelligent about the markets into which you buy, and that can lead to better outcomes. Um, there are a lot of key principles that will help you acquire this market intelligence. Raj is going to tell us about those here in just a minute, I promise. Um, and then I'm going to bring us home with some techniques that you'll be able to try right away to find the best contractors that fit you and your customers' needs. So we're going to cover those objectives through a story from Raj. It, uh, it's going to be really awesome. And then, and then we're going to walk through the principles, challenges, and techniques. I've introduced myself. Uh, I am a, a director of learning and content development at Public Spend Forum. I know a little bit about market research because I did it while I was a contracting officer in the federal government. I also taught it uh, to other procurement professionals that were starting out in a, in a very neat program at the Department of Veterans Affairs. I'm really passionate about improving public procurement. I think it's important and um, necessary to vibrant and healthy government. And uh, ever since I've been in the profession, I've enjoyed breaking down, you know, challenging, arcane, complex topics into language and content that people can actually understand. And, uh, and that's enough talking from me for a minute. Raj, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Welcome, everyone. Uh, really excited to be here. And I want to first thank uh, NIGP uh, and our partnership there. We're really excited to be working with all the great people and, and also just to be collaborating on a number of really important areas such as market research. Um, so uh, my passion, as you may know, I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Public Spend Forum. And as someone who's spent over 20 years, uh, first with private sector, but now really a lot with government, uh, on procurement. Um, I believe that information uh, and management practices are really key to transforming the way we spend $10 trillion uh, across the world. And that's uh, what we're on a mission to change uh, in collaboration with all these great people. Um, and uh, I truly believe if we do that, um, the power of procurement, the $10 trillion, we can serve our citizens better and we can address uh, what we all know to be some key challenges out there. So, uh, so that's what keeps us going and excited about what we're doing. So um, before I hand it back to uh, Frank, uh, just a very quick word about Public Spend Forum, if you don't know already. Well, Public Spend Forum is a market intelligence and best practice platform, and we're working across federal, state, local governments. Our goal is to really bring you the best content and data. Uh, there's some things we do better uh, that really dive into some topics, but then we also work with partners, uh, really, um, where we can bring some of the best content around the world uh, to you. Um, we have supplier and market knowledge data, um, which is a big part of the topic today. Um, also, best practice frameworks and standards, uh, some that we're, again, collaborating with NIGP on, and then a global community uh, that uh, and we can all work with. Uh, today, we'll, uh, throughout the webinar today, we won't be talking too much about GovShop, but just wanted to mention that GovShop.com, it's a new search engine that we just introduced. Uh, it's in beta, and we encourage you to check it out um, and give us all the feedback you can. Uh, it's basically a free market research tool uh, that hopefully helps you do some of the things we're going to talk about today. So that's enough said. I'm going to hand it back to Frank uh, to just tee us up.
Thanks, Raj. And I'm very excited about GovShop too. It's been a lot of fun launching that over the past couple of months. Like I said, this uh, topic today is about becoming an information superhero. And once you do that, you can use information as your superpower. Now, we think conducting market research and gathering market intelligence is critical to the acquisition process. Uh, and it really sort of helps to convey some of the tips and techniques for conducting efficient, effective market research. And Raj is going to tell us a story that I think is going to help put those into focus. And this is a personal story. I'm not going to say too much more because I think it's great to hear it from Raj himself. So Raj, go ahead and, and walk us through this experience of yours. So I'm just going to take about 10 minutes and um, hopefully we'll be able to illustrate some of the principles through this. And then we will cover more specifically in detail some of the key principles that may be highlighted through the story. So um, I, I like this, um, uh, this starting point for this, a sorry, not, not sorry. And uh, some of you may be familiar with an Indian sorry. Well, uh, a few years ago, I was on my way to India. And as I was about to leave for the airport, my wife pulled me aside. And basically, she had a purchasing requirement for me. I need you to buy an Indian sari while you're in Delhi, she said. Well, a last minute purchasing requirement as I'm walking out the door about something I really don't know much about. Um, as, uh, I'm sure there's many of you uh, on this mm, webinar right now that uh, have experienced the same situation, a last minute requirement about something we're w vaguely familiar with. Um, so uh, I asked her, can you tell me more about the sari? Is there a particular style, color? I asked her. And even as she was telling me more, uh, I was wondering about all the other questions that any of us wonder about purchasing requirements. Where do you buy a sari? So what, where, where are the stores and suppliers? Uh, how much should it cost? Well, her answer to that was, spend what you think is appropriate. Um, <laughs> I, I consider that to be a loaded answer. Anyways, uh, then moving to then, um, you know, how does this uh, really kind of connect to procurement? What I, I did know right then was I lacked critical information. You could say critical market information. I needed more information about the requirement, about the market, about suppliers, about costs, about how best to negotiate. Um, so uh, again, this is something that you all deal with on a daily basis. Um, so how do we take this challenge on where we don't have, we have a requirement, we don't know really what to do, right? Or we are vaguely familiar with what's going on. Um, so I would argue that information is the single biggest factor in delivering good procurement outcomes. It's not process, it's not regulations, it's information. And in fact, we believe the title of this uh, webinar, information can be a superpower uh, for you, uh, and for everyone involved in procurement to power all purchases. This is, of course, not just my opinion. The importance of information as a key characteristic of any good market transaction, um, that's been established for a long time by economists. Um, econ uh, if, if any of you have taken any economics classes, um, you know, economic theory simply states that all parties must have equal information as part of any effective transaction. That's a really, really important concept to understand. All parties must have equal information to really create a good transaction. Um, but that doesn't often exist. So you, what you see on this slide, uh, there's often a situation called uh, information asymmetry where there's information disparity basically when one party has way more information than the other. Um, and this is, again, a very uh, basic concept within economics, that if you have information asymmetry, you're not going to get good deals. And um, so, so hold that thought with you as we go through uh, a lot of this uh, webinar today. Um, so um, when parties, what's the impact of unequal information and a information asymmetry? Um, well, the results, in my opinion, not just in my opinion, I've seen enough of this uh, in many examples, the results can be devastating for both buyers and suppliers. So one, government issues solicitations that 
maybe don't make much sense to suppliers, conducts poor negotiations, ultimately gets a bad deal that may never deliver the intended outcome. Suppliers also get frustrated, right? Uh, they may not understand the requirement. They may have to propose a pricing structure that doesn't make sense. So we all suffer as a result. Here we are now, I'm back, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in Delhi, and uh, picture me in this crazy crowded market like you see here, 120 degrees, standing in an, um, really um, uh, back to back with people everywhere you look, Times Square during Christmas, that's how I describe it. Well, luckily I had done my market research and gotten the information I needed to be a prepared buyer. So in this case, a lot of my information actually came from an expert. And this expert actually was my uncle who lived in Delhi. He took time to understand the requirement um, in terms of what kind of sari my wife wanted, told me exactly where to go and potentially what stores to go to, which stores to go to. I trusted his advice because I, I knew he had lived in Delhi. I'm not really sure how he knew, knew so much about saris, uh, but uh, he did. And so, um, and, and I would say a trusted source is, uh, as you'll see in, uh, as we discuss some of the ways to gather market research, a trusted source is uh, one of the places you can go, right? Whether it's on the internet, but also experts out there. So in this case, I was, it was my uncle. So. After going to a few stores, I was at the place where I ultimate purchased a sari. So it kind of looked like this, you could say. And if any of you have been to you know, India or in other places like that, you, you, this may look familiar. As I talked to one of the salesmen, he started throwing down sari after sari, so as you see here. And pretty soon the entire table was covered. Um, well, let's just say I figured out what I wanted to get. Now it was time to negotiate. And just then, I remembered one important piece of information that my uncle had given me. And he had said, whatever price they tell you, offer one-tenth the amount and don't pay any more than quarter of the quoted price. So let me repeat that. Whatever price they give you, offer only one-tenth the amount and don't pay any more than quarter of the quoted price. Now, that's very vital information that I would have never known unless I had done my research and talked to an expert. So end of the story um, is that, you know, I was able to walk away a very happy customer and uh -huh. I ended up with a good deal, a great sorry, and ultimately a happy wife. So I was a happy camper myself. So, um, so that's, that's really the point of the story here. Hopefully we all can see is that information, whether you're talking about in a personal context, but obviously in a professional context and with the kind of jobs we all have uh, in a business context and in a government context, it's much more complex in terms of the kinds of information we need. So that leads us to really, um, you know, the key principles and, and the rest of the webinar that we want to walk through. So what is market intelligence? So what we'll cover, by the way, in this section, the rest of the, the webinar, and please, we would highly encourage you to ask questions. And even uh, if you want to speak, we can unmute you. Uh, we're, so let's start with what is market intelligence. This is a very basic definition here. Um, the way we describe it is it's, uh, it's really a uh, comprehensive understanding of the suppliers. Sorry, in previous slide, please. So it's it's a pre, uh, it's it's a full understanding of suppliers and industries. So that means understanding capabilities, trends, costs. We'll talk about some of the questions that we want to be asking, and also it requires many of those questions require really uh, direct engagement in the industry as well. And so it can't just be you know I go to Google and and do searches. So this is one of the themes you'll hear. Uh, throughout this webinar today, as well as uh, other ones. But then that leads you to, um, you know, when you gather all that information, then you need objectivity in your analysis and how you interpret that information. So how do you take all of that information, put it through a filter of objectivity and against uh, customer requirements, and to finally, all the way to the very right, uh, lead you to actionable insights. So ultimately, you know, our goal is not to end up with a book report. We, what we need are actionable insights that will inform our, maybe our requirements, maybe our uh, procurement strategy, maybe with suppliers we reach out to and, and how we conduct our negotiations. So that's market intelligence. 
Hey Raj, we have a question from Andrea. She's curious, in your opinion, how would you select an information, uh, sorry, an expert for information like your uncle in India when you're a novice at the product that you're seeking to buy? Great question, and and that's definitely comes up when we uh, one of the uh, one of our key principles we'll cover is around uh, sources. Um, but let me just answer that really quick, and then we can cover that in more detail. Um, but essentially, um, it's it's uh, there. There are a multitude of ways. I was I would suggest that you know one answer that just comes top of mind is uh, you might you might see an expert as you're doing your research and reading uh, different reports, etc. That somebody is cited multiple times, right? Uh, or uh, you see them cited, but you're still not convinced, and you go to their LinkedIn profile, and and you say, oh, this person has a breadth of experience. They've published a number of times, or somebody might just tell you, um, and 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 they say, hey, um, you know, you should talk to this and this person from this association, for instance, or somebody says, uh, you uh, need to talk to Raj about market research because you know we've heard him talk about multiple times about this. So, so there are a multitude of ways, and and uh, I would just suggest that you you know want to again do your homework to make sure that it's a credible source. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. So, uh, what is market and where does market intelligence fit in the procurement process? Um, so, uh, most of the time, unfortunately, it starts in the middle of this chart. Uh, which is really during the procurement uh, process. And where it should start, again, you'll hear this throughout this um, um, session, is at the very front end on the left, program strategy and planning. Because some of the insights that you gain from doing proper market research, proper market intelligence, may inform and change some of the way you do your requirements, for instance. So that's really important that it should start there, um, but too often it does not. And we'll talk about you know, what we can do about that. But um, uh, it, it does often focus uh, still on uh, within, within the procurement process once you, get, or, uh, once you get a requirement. And we'll talk about what are the things we can do to still improve our requirement. And finally, this may not be apparent, but market research can still actually play a role in your performance management, your contract management, because, you know, once uh, we sign, I say, a multi-year deal, you can actually still benchmark how the supplier is doing relative to, say, how an industry might be changing, how things may be changing. So especially if you're in dynamic industries, you have to see maybe this supplier isn't keeping up or the contract you did isn't keeping up with the times, right? And so I'm sure you've all experienced that. And, and that's not always apparent, but that's also an important part um, of, of really tracking the market and making sure we're continuing to deliver value and outcomes. A question that just came in, it says, um, it's from Sh uh, Sean Scott or Scott Sean. Um, and it says, is there not an internal perspective that is missing on the left side? Insights must have some internal context. Absolutely. Um, uh, I think if it's, um, I, I totally agree, uh, Sean, uh, that, um, a lot of times your expertise might be inside, right? Your, uh, your program managers or your uh, people that have already been purchasing, you might have colleagues that have already gone and done some of these things. So, uh, but you need both an internal understanding of, you know, the context that Sean is saying, uh, of what are your needs, right? And then those are some of the questions we'll ask in a minute. Um, so, so that's really important as well. Yeah, Raj, and I can add on to that a little yeah. bit too. I mean, I know one thing I used to do if I took over a new contract or had to recompete something that I wasn't too familiar with, you know, I would just look in the contract file and try to see who was the last awarding contracting officer and give that individual a call and ask them, you know, do you have any background information or people that you spoke with that were really helpful? Mm -hmm. um, your cores, your, you know, contracting officers, representatives, the technical representatives out there that are on the program side are great resources for this. I mean, they should be participating in the market research process with you. And ideally they are, but you know, if they're not, get them in a room and pick their brain. Um, so those are a couple good internal resources that you can leverage as well. Great, great. No, I think that's a, that's a great point as well. Again, I think, you know, hopefully as we continue this series, we'll capture some of these points and any other things that people may want to share, share them through chat as well, and we'll capture all of that. 
So if we go to the next slide then, um, then so if we know what market intelligence is at a high level and, 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 and uh, where it fits in, um, we know it's not the easiest process in the world either, no matter you know, uh, how well versed you may be. Um, one, I think we can all relate to this, who has the time, <laughs> right? I, hopefully we all build in some amount of time to do effective market research, but time is definitely needed. And, and uh, you know, that, that, that's something that we know that everybody's really overburdened with, you know, just, just the need to just constantly push through transactions, et cetera. Um, you, all, you need time, you know, not just to do your transaction, do kind of some basic research, but number two here, you need time also to really keep up with all the, how fast the world is changing, right? Markets are changing so quickly. It's not just in technology across the board. And, and technology in many ways is impacting other industries as well. So, you know, keeping up with the markets, it's, it's very difficult. Um, and uh, I'll attest having done a number of market research projects myself. And then, you know, when you do have the time, it still may be a very time consuming process because data is all over the place, right? There aren't great, and like there are sources, uh, but it's very fragmented the way we describe it. You know, it's piecemeal. You could go through Google, you go through some government databases, you could go through other databases, you know. Sometimes it's honestly in people's heads, right? And, and like we said, these experts that we want to talk to. So, um, so there are a number of challenges. And if we go to the next slide, just a couple of other points uh, there. You know, there's also when you do start finding information, we talked about objectivity earlier. Uh, it's really important that you know, um, you always consider the source and the inherent bias that may be there. And it's not because somebody's trying to taint something or bias something, but you just need to understand where the information might be coming from. So, you know, we always say triangulate, that's the term we use, triangulate the information, meaning if you can corroborate with a couple other sources, then, you know, you know that you're headed in the right direction. Uh, market research oftentimes also lacks critical insights. You might find, you know, big reports, et cetera. Um, but what does that mean from your procurement strategy, acquisition strategy? Um, so that's, that's another challenge. And then again, uh, the, the, the big point we'll talk about is how do we also engage industry effectively, right? Because they often know what's going on. That's why we're looking at them as partners, right? Is because they have the expertise in many cases. So we really need to uh, engage them effectively early enough um, so we can, you know, also, also obviously gain from their uh, expertise. So key principles. We've laid down four key principles and uh, they're really, I'll cover each of them. So one is about, you know, incorporating market intelligence into your requirements development. Second is about asking the right questions. Uh, third is about finding the right resources then, which we've talked a little bit about. And then fourth, uh, it's really about engaging suppliers throughout the process. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I do see there's a... Um, yeah, Raj, that's a, this is coming in from, uh, from Sean, and I think he's curious about when is the best time to do market intelligence at a commodity strategy level or sort of a more tactical bid transaction level? Great, great question. Um, so I would say definitely if you are building a commodity strategy, uh, absolutely, you know, the, especially the bigger, more comprehensive analysis uh, needs to happen right there, right? Because uh, what is a commodity strategy and when you're doing strategic sourcing or category management, you need to really understand all your purchases, right? And, and look ahead for the next year or maybe multiple years what your requirements may be, right? And, and so you definitely want to make sure you've done your homework before you go out and establish, you know, a number of contracts or vehicles, whatever you might do in supplier relationships. So definitely there. But I would also stress that you want to do it um, at a transaction level, too, because, again, you know, there's lots of different contract vehicles and things that you might leverage. But, you know, some of these requirements on their own on a task order level are quite complex. And again, industry is changing. So just because you did that research, you know, for a broad, let's say you set it up for, you know, management consulting services, you might have very specific requirements than for say a task order related to, I don't know, HR consulting, right? 
that would require you to do some research beyond what that category uh, level analysis might have entailed. So, so I would say both. But, but it's probably a different set of questions that you're asking. Yeah, I mean, I do think in my, you know, in my opinion, it's, it's if, if you know you're buying into a, a market consistently, let's just, you know, you manage your, your programs, you know, fleet management program. I wrote a blog about this <clears throat> recently. If, if, if it's fleet management then, that you're in, uh, you need to understand the car industry. You need to understand the inputs and outputs, the raw materials, the price fluctuations, you know, what's the cost of steel? When's the right time to buy? Do you lease? These are all strategic market intelligence matters but when it comes time to actually procure new vehicles that's when you do in tactical market research you're looking at current prices you're looking at features you're looking and comparing automobiles so, i mean i think that's that's kind of how i've always described it but market intelligence in my opinion and i think raj would agree is something that we should be aspiring to achieve throughout the, the acquisition process i mean it's just kind of part of our job as procurement professionals so incorporate market intelligence as part of requirements development. I put in this uh, red uh, text here. Uh, just, uh, I think again, you know, one of the comments, and it's a fair comment that a lot of people make, right? It's, um, it's like, we don't really get a chance. We just get our requirements document. So that's why I say, if you're lucky enough to get involved before a requirement has been defined. Um, but, you know, we'll talk about what things you can do in a minute if you aren't, haven't been involved. But um, if you are or, you know, you're just getting a requirement statement from somebody, I would suggest that you still ask some of these questions and then go a layer deeper depending on what you're obviously what, it, what the requirement looks like. But, you know, the, the, the most critical, most basic questions, but honestly have the most difficult answers uh, and, and uh, are... Uh, the ones at the top here. Um, what is the problem that's being solved? What are the pain points? Because, you know, oftentimes people come up with a solution, right, when they write a requirement, as opposed to thinking about what's the problem being solved, right? What are the pain points? Like, what is, what will be fixed, right? If I'm successful, what will have happened? What pain will I have resolved? I would suggest ask that question, um, even if you just get a requirement statement, and, and you're likely to get, you know, first puzzled looks because they don't know the answer or they haven't thought about it. But then once you start that conversation, you get all sorts of insights, right? And that becomes really critical to thinking about, okay, what's the scope of this thing, right? Uh, what is most critical to achieving success? What capabilities do I need, right? Uh, as opposed to thinking about the solution, uh, which is often what, you know, a lot of requirement statements and RFQs look like. Um, we've already come up with an answer and we're really telling industry or suppliers to just respond to something as opposed to offer their expertise. So that's what the second point leads, leads to then. Uh, develop a problem statement to issue to suppliers, right? Um, so I would suggest that if it's possible, and you know, even if you're thinking about an RFI, for instance, think about a problem statement. Again, if you've asked those questions up front uh, on the top, then you know, you can really frame out the context of your organization, the scope of it, and say, you know what, these are the pain points we're experiencing. This is what we need to do as an organization, as, a, as an agency, whatever that requirement might be. And, and, and here are the issues we have, and um, these are the outcomes we need to achieve. Tell us how best to do it, right? Uh, now, you may have specific questions as well, but um, it's important that we really allow um, suppliers and experts to help us, you know, solve some of these uh, questions up front. It's really about asking the right questions. You know, any, I would just suggest forget about market research for a second and step back and, and, and think about any research. Any research starts with what question am I starting? To, what question or questions am I trying to answer, right? And if you don't know that, where do you start, right? What do you, you just throw in a keyword into Google and hope that, you know, some good stuff comes up? Um, we know that's not, that's not going to be the answer, right? So you have to first start with the right questions. And I would stress that over and over again. Um, so, uh, and on this slide, we've kind of 
categorize them into four buckets. And there's many, many, many more. It's not that you have to use these. I would just suggest that you st and step back and ask uh, the questions that are relevant to you. So over here, we have just understanding the overall market. You know, what's the market segments? We'll talk about the value chain in a second. What's the value chain of an industry? So, you know, and, and we'll talk about that concept, you know, whether should I go to a manufacturer like Dell or should I go to Best Buy, right? Or should I go to a value added reseller to buy something? Um, I don't know. Uh, it depends on what your requirements are. Um, and then, and what outcomes you're looking for. Um, what are the key trends in the market, right? Sometimes that's important to understand. Um, you know, if the market is over capacity and uh, Frank just mentioned fleet, I just read an article that said, you know, buying fleet, the best time to buy any cars, even from a personal standpoint, is at the end of the model year which makes total sense, right? But there, there are key things like that that you can pick up when you're doing your research. Um, ask questions about the supplier base, right? So who are the different types of suppliers out there? Small, large, incumbent, new? What's the minority supplier base look like, right? Um, what kind of capabilities do they bring to the table, right? Are there different sets of capabilities or are all the suppliers doing the exact same set of things, right? Um, and they just happen to be different in terms of size, et cetera. Are there new players coming into the market, right? Um, there's, especially in fast moving markets, you have all these nimble, uh, agile players coming in. Uh, it's really important to consider them uh, and, and make sure that we know where they exist. Third is um, capabilities of suppliers. So that's really important. You know, I mentioned it just a, a minute ago, but you know, what are the key capabilities? And what are the key differences among suppliers? Now, I'll, I'll just, you know, I bolded this question just to kind of stress this point. It's not just good enough to a ask the question, what are the key capabilities? Because, you know, what you'll find is, let's say 50% of the capabilities are exactly the same among 10 suppliers that you're looking at. But it's really important to understand the key differences and where, what are the other strengths that may be for different suppliers? Because then the trick is to go back and match it up to what you need, right? Where, where your pain points are. It goes back to those pain points we just talked about and what your requirements might be, right? And so, so knowing we, which kind of suppliers might be better fits for you, um, it requires you to, one, understand those pain points and what you're looking for and then say, okay, how do the suppliers differ? Which ones may be better suited for us versus others, right? And I think this is one of the classic things that I see honestly all the time. Um, that's a flaw in a lot of, especially government procurements, but private sector too, I've worked with enough fortune clients. Uh, but we don't take, we just consider all the suppliers to be pretty similar and we don't really take time to understand how they're different. And I would say that's probably one of the most important things to understand. And then the economics of cost and pricing. Um, you know, uh, uh, the high, basically, you know, how are you going to negotiate a deal with them, right? And, and you need, in order to do that, you need to understand their costs. Um, you need to understand what their pricing models look like. So for instance, SaaS models now, right? A lot of people struggle with that because it's a different way of buying software. So how do you do that? How do you, what are their pricing models? Are they selling, you know, per seat? Uh, or is it just, you know, uh, for the entire organization for the year? Is it monthly? Um, there, there might be different considerations that you need to understand uh, as you start to dig in here. We did have a, it was a comment from um, Timmy, uh, who's just reinforcing that market research, um, you know, really is step one in the, in the process, not just to justify requirements, but really to justify whether a procurement should move forward. So I think that's, that's awesome advice. Hey, there's a, there's a question from Andrea Black. Um, so supplier difference should not impact the lowest bid when you spec a product given term of delivery and installation. Um, I'm not sure I completely understand the comment, um, but mm, yeah, if, especially when we're talking about products, Andrea, I, I would agree that if we, you know, if we're, if we're talking about a product and you already have specs, um, then, you know, the product price may be the um, bigger driver, but like you say, if there are other things like delivery terms and, 
and installation, et cetera, maybe that's something that would make a difference for you, right? Maybe one supplier doesn't install at all, for instance, right? They have no installation services, another one does. Maybe that's something you require, or maybe it's not, right? So again, goes back. So I would agree, you know, if it's just a product and you have the specs down, then it probably is the, uh, the, uh, the price. Deidre did have a question, but she didn't have a microphone, so she chatted in. It's about IT markets, and I think she's curious about how you can stay abreast of, of what's going on. I mean, I know that's a challenge for anyone with how fast IT moves. Uh, I mean, a couple of, of points I would suggest are, you know, read read things that, that are relevant to IT. So federalcomputerweek.com. That's an amazing resource for, I mean, it is a federal, you know, uh, news site, but they cover a lot of things about, about IT. Same with, you know, uh, 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 NextGov is a great resource. You got to read constantly about it. Find industry publications that are relevant to government IT. You know, read govtech.com. Follow thought leaders on social media who are, studying and paid to do this type of research. Um, you know, it's certainly not easy to stay abreast of an entire market, but you know, if it were easy, they probably wouldn't call it a job. Um, and I know that you're, you know, uh, all of you are out there looking for great resources and information is, um, not hard to find, but good information is. So I'd say if you find great resources and if anybody else knows of a good resource on how to stay on top of the IT market, please chat it to everyone here so um, you know we can spread that information. Raj, any, any thoughts there about specific IT market information or intelligence? Yeah, I, I would say that again, uh, probably not just IT, but any, and we, we do by the way are putting kind of resources and what sources to go to for different markets. But I would say that, um, yeah, in addition to kind of some of the general media publications, et cetera, Frank, um, other, other things, uh, you need to just know which industry you're talking about first, right? So IT is so broad. If you were saying, let's say, um, certain types of software, then I would find the right publications, right? Uh, like we were saying, right, you know, what were the associations out there that cover every industry has an association? By the way, this question, this, this, what we're talking about right now is really principle three about the sources, um, uh, which we're going to discuss next. Um, but, you know, uh, they're, they're, what are the publications out there? Are there research houses that cover that industry or a specific industry? Uh, who are the experts out there? Who are the associations? Um, and it does require them um, a constant kind of keeping up. Um, and, and that's where I think, you know, I would suggest um, that, you know, depending on if hopefully you're specializing in a couple of areas. Unfortunately, a lot of government procurement is organized in a way that you know you're not able to specialize or some of the organizations are uh, that you're all working within are very small right and you have to buy everything because there's only three four of you so um so if you're able to still identify kind of what those sources are and it, it's it's honestly just keeping up it's 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 constant kind of requirements to keep up and it takes some time to build that expertise and if you don't have it because you don't have the time, then I would say find those experts that can help you, right? It might be just picking up the phone and calling somebody at an association or at some research house. Right. Yeah, I mean, intelligence is gained over time. It's just not like you, you know, all of a sudden you wake up intelligent. You just have to read everything and immerse yourself in it. And slowly you'll start to build a knowledge base. And over time, you know, you start to really, it starts to click. So um, keep at it. Don't get frustrated. What this is just showing as an example, the, the idea of value chain is basically at every step of a value chain, somebody's adding value. So hence the term value chain, right? And in this case, what you're seeing is temp workers going through agencies and then you know, government uh, would maybe contract agency just means, by the way, a temp agency that doesn't mean government agency on the slide. Um, but uh, a government agency or companies might go back through these agencies. Um, so understanding how that works, who's providing what value, I would say this slide is a little outdated. A new version of this would also show a direct line 
from the, the, the people, the temp workers, all the way back to the companies, um, because now you can access and get them through internet, for instance, through sites like Upwork, uh, which in, you know, so you don't have to pay uh, some prime contractor a bunch of money uh, to get access to some expertise. There are a lot of sites, honestly, you can find more and more people and probably get access to more expertise than going through and paying a bunch of overhead fees through some prime or through some agency. So just in this example, understanding kind of which way, where can you go, right? Should I go all the way back to the temp workers in this day and age if this slide were different? Or should I go through an agency? Should I go through a prime contractor? It's just one example of why you need to understand a value chain. I gave the other example before of um, you know um, IT or, or computers, right? Should you go to Dell directly to buy a computer or negotiate uh, you know, uh, a contract? Should you go through a retailer like Best Buy? Should you go through a value added reseller? It depends on your requirement and, and where you go. Um, so again, I, I, I understand this, but match it up against your needs again. So where, where do you find all this information? Honestly, this is a very basic slide right now. And every one of these puzzles is different, you know, depending on what you're looking for, but you get better and better. That's what I can tell you. So, you know, just like anything else we do, it's practice, practice, practice. Um, so that's what I would encourage, but let me just kind of cover this slide. Um, so secondary research. First of all, you know, we all do Google searches, right? Uh, uh, Frank is going to cover, I'm going to touch on it a little bit, but Frank's also going to cover more keywords and how do you do research. Um, uh, but, but that's a place a lot of people start, right? Um, but I would say internet research, if you're starting there, or honestly, with any of these other sources, having those list of questions is really important because then you can do better searches. Um, Research providers, you know, we've listed ourselves on here um, and all our uh, information is free, by the way. Um, then you have, uh, you know, IBIS. I think a number of you use IBIS reports. You have Gartner, AMR Research, DataQuest, Forrester. Uh, these are just more IT, right? But, but there's also um, every industry, every association has also publications, journals, um, so just look into that, right? See who's covering cybersecurity. For instance, you know, we've been doing a lot of research on cybersecurity and we found all these great experts and journals and everything that, you know, cover the space and we're getting all sorts of expertise and insights from that. Associations, right? We're here with, uh, you know, NIGP um, and uh, which does a great service for its members, right? Similarly, um, there are associations for everything you can think of, right? And so, and their job is what, right? To help their companies. And guess what? They pass on information when you call them. So, um, so industry associations, analyst reports, company SEC filings, you know, there are a lot of public companies are required, not a lot, all public companies are required to file analysts, uh, file SEC filings, right? And uh, Wall Street analysts write about them. You won't believe the wealth of information you can get out some of, the, some of that. And, and it's, a lot of it is free uh, out there. Uh, but it does require you to go back to principle two of knowing what questions you're asking. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody else had any uh, sources, but again, you know, it depends on um, mm, uh, different, different, um, 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 sorry, uh, depends on what you're buying. Um, so the other thing I, I would suggest is um, uh, prior, somebody just chatted in a comment, prior bids and transactions. Absolutely. I think uh, Frank also mentioned, you know, go talk to your, uh, you know, the contracting officer that might have done this, right? The core. Um, um, so absolutely, your program managers, uh, call other agencies that might have done this. So absolutely, that's a great source. I, I do want to say that, um, you know, so uh, uh, as we talk about primary research, the first point I want to make is that don't be afraid to pick up the phone and talk to somebody. Um, it's so easy and it's easier than, uh, than you think. And you know, if you're shy about it, just, just get the courage one time and one time you do it, believe me, you'll do it a second and third and fourth time. Uh, just, and so many people are willing to be helpful. 
especially if you're prepared with the right set of questions and you give them some information. So, you know, build those muscles, <laughs> you know, the picking up the phone and calling somebody and getting more confident about that. Uh, don't be afraid about that. Um, and, and call us if you have any questions. And, you know, if we don't know the answer, which, you know, in many cases we won't, uh, we'll send you to the right people, right, that we may know. Um, so primary research, you want to, you know, suppliers, again, we have a next principle that talks about suppliers, but definitely you want to be talking to suppliers and, and asking them, you know, about their expertise and know that it's going to be biased in some way. Uh, and, and so, but that shouldn't prevent you from talking to them, right? Sorry, go ahead, Frank. Yeah, Raj, actually on this, on this topic, Victoria has a question about how do you err on the side of caution when it comes to speaking with companies and not precluding them from the procurement? And that's a great question. It's actually a topic that we addressed in, in one of our five-minute videos on our YouTube site. We'll include that link in the post-event materials. But, um, you know, there's a, there's a couple different strategies. Number one, you know, that solicitation, when you put that out on the streets, that's a triggering event. I think anything that you do or discuss before you put a solicitation out is pretty much fair game. Um, I think if you want to be, uh, you know, safe, and it's just a good practice in general is to, you know, record those conversations, take notes. If you divulge something about the procurement to one company, write it in the solicitation when it goes out or, or issue an amendment if it happens after the solicitation is established. You know, information and insight into a procurement does not automatically create an um, organizational conflict of interest. Uh, but I definitely recommend, you know, be aware of your organization's policy. What is your OCI policy? What is your policy on, on communicating with, with industry? A lot of times you'll find that it's more liberal and uh, and encouraging of those conversations that you might think, but I definitely understand that it can be intimidating to talk to contractors and suppliers out there. Um, but all, I mean, having served as one, and I think Raj can attest. You know, we genuinely do want to help. You know, we we understand the pressures that that contracting professionals are under, and I think the information we provide will be you know to the best of our knowledge. And I don't think it's always a scheme about you know how do I gain an edge in in the ultimate procurement. Raj, anything else to add there? Yeah, I mean, it goes back to the point about bias, right? I think that's why we said no. If you recall the very first slide uh, when we started talking about market uh, intelligence, is it said you know objectivity, right? And and make sure you know the source. And every source, I don't care how objective a party wants to be, has some bias. Okay, it's not again because somebody's trying to do something wrong. And I think that's sometimes perceived. And I would just encourage that. You know, don't always think that it's, it's, it's always somebody's trying to give you bad information or something. But, you know, if supplier is giving you information, yes, they have to sell business, right? And they are going to give you stuff that makes them look good. So just, you just need to know that, right? And, and, and uh, similarly, you could say, you know, you get a Wall Street report, they have their own objective, right? So you just have to make sure you understand the context uh, of why, where you're getting, you know, some information. And then I think if you piece together stuff, that's what the whole process of triangulation, we, you know, we may do a webinar, we, as part of this series, that's more about really doing some exercises like this, where you gather three, four pieces of information on the same question, and then say, how do you actually draw a conclusion out of those if they're giving you slightly different answers? But that's the process of triangulation. You know, it's just knowing your source, knowing the bias, knowing how do you put it all together and saying, okay, what conclusion do I draw from it that I can use? So, uh, but yeah, I, 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 you know, don't let the bias part stop you uh, because every source you look at is going to be biased. You know, some contracting officer you talk to, right, I, I can guarantee you is going to be biased because they might say that we did the best research since sliced bread. And that might be true for their specific requirement, but you might be facing something slightly different. So you need to understand that. And so I, I, I would just kind of just keep stressing that point, you know, consider the source and, uh, you know, what their objective might have been. And we have some great, you know, communication happening in the chat too with some valuable insights, you know, folks recommending holding a workshop. If you've got an active procurement or an active solicitation out there, hold a workshop, invite suppliers in, 
you know, the federal government, we're real big fans of reverse industry days where you actually have the, uh, you know, rather than the government speaking to suppliers, you assemble the government, you know, maybe it's the procurement team, maybe it's the program team, and you have suppliers come in and actually tell you about what they do and what makes their products and services different. And you give everybody a chance, you know, to do that. So, um, you know, I would definitely encourage people to get creative, uh, you know, but, but stay within the boundaries of what does, um, is, is, um, you know, legal and appropriate in there. So, and I think, and Timmy, hi, Timmy, uh, from Pennsylvania, just, uh, mentioned supplier forums, which I'm very familiar with, uh, uh, uh in talking to Timmy as well as, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, their supplier forums. And I think many, uh, many of you probably do some type of supplier forums, but I think if you're not, I think uh, you can reach out to Timmy or ask us and we'll refer you back to some of these people uh, that are experts in it. Um, but yeah, that's a great way. I think that that's a, maybe a, uh, well, before I move on to that topic, um, but it's, it's a great way to get, again, you know, a two-way dialogue going. I will say one thing, you know, sometimes we've seen these, you know, they're called industry days and they're the worst uh, organized. And, and it seems like one-way talk where government gets up and basically tells suppliers what they want, what they need, and then there's no dialogue. And you should never be in any conversation. It's not really a conversation, right? If there's not a two-way dialogue, it's a waste of time. I would, I would just say, very strongly say that. Uh, I, unfortunately, on webinars, hopefully we're doing a good job just keeping even the chat engaging. But, you know, a one-way dialogue is not useful. So, you know, always push yourself to have a real conversation um, where you can go back and forth because you'll take a lot more away from it. Uh, let me just finish up on this slide here, primary research, you know, um, uh, so a couple of, like we said, pick up the phone, call industry experts, association experts, um, and, 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 you know, go through your list of questions, right? And, and uh, I guarantee they'll give you some useful information, or if they don't, they might point you to somebody else. Surveys are another way, you know, you do, uh, but you, you to go to put, put a good survey together, you do have to be prepared and have done some homework ahead of time. Uh, and, and again, the survey questions that are then are more uh, better formulated then. And then of course, I think many of you have probably done RFIs. Uh, again, you know, um, RFIs I think can be two types. One can be like this problem statement that we were talking about. Others can be more specific, right? Um, but I, I can also tell you a lot of suppliers we've heard from hate RFIs because they feel like a lot of times supply and government is basically not, it doesn't want to do its homework and just basically ask suppliers, tell us everything. You, and, and, and a lot of, especially the better suppliers basically, you know, have refused to fill out RFIs because, and, and, you know, we, there's actually a really good conversation by the way, uh, that was uh, on our site about this. Um, and, and so my, my recommendation here on RFIs is, you know, do your homework and be specific about the kinds of things you wanna do and don't just ask basic questions in an RFI, like tell me about your business and you know, um, uh, it needs to be much more specific about things that you may not have found out through your research. So keywords, um, again, uh, Frank's gonna cover this in a little bit more detail, but uh, the main point I wanna make here is that um, search terms, um, uh, again, require a little bit of creativeness. Sometimes I'm sure all of us have done searches where, you know, one term or terms you use doesn't give you the best result, then you go back and try again, right? And this is where the, your questions can also help you. Um, so again, we'll cover this in more detail. So I'll just skip past this uh, right now and we'll come back and discuss uh, in a, a few more slides. Um, and then, you know, just go to, uh, going to principle four, then engaging suppliers. I think we've talked about some of this, that, you know, we want to move away from the left side of the slide, one-sided limited dialogue late in the process to early, it's a real conversation and collaboration, and it's done with some homework already done uh, by us, right? And by us, when I say that, I say that as, as government. Um, so that's really important. Um, so, but do it as early as possible. Like Frank was saying earlier that, you know, if you haven't started the requirement issued uh, a procurement out there, there's most 
most jurisdictions that we've worked with, uh, federal, state, local, there's nothing that prevents you from talking to suppliers, right? As long as it's an open process, um, and there's nothing that prevents you. So, um, so that's really, really important. Um, so, and, and um, you know, I think there's always this, this notion that if we talk to a few suppliers, what are other ones going to say? If you keep an open process, um, then, you know, if uh, others decide not to respond, uh, we haven't seen a single procurement that got protested or, or at least got overruled. I can tell you, I've been personally involved in actually driving some very, very complex procurements. And every time they got protested, not a single one stood its ground, right? And, and so, and, and we had a lot of industry engagement as part of that. So you just have to make sure it's an open process. It's fair to everyone and we're not just biasing it towards, you know, uh, certain people. And we're happy to kind of share at least what we know uh, from that standpoint. Well, I mean, you know, and also I think, I think we've got a comment in here about, you know, conducting surveys or getting feedback from just a few suppliers may give an edge to those suppliers, but Hey, that's just how it works. I mean, if I know who the buyer is and I've done my research as a supplier and I can get some information before the solicitation hits the street, that's good. That's what, that's my job in business development, you know? So I, I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. A competitive advantage exists. And, um, you know, that, that doesn't mean that, that you've created a, um, a conflict of interest or anything like that, you know? So Again, we should, yeah, we should think, aspire uh, yeah. for fair and open competition, of course, but yeah, just understand that exists. I think that is an important point that, you know, uh, look the best companies, you know, they also need to know how to do business development, right? And, and so as much as, you know, we can try to help other companies, and I think we do that by being fair and open, right? And making sure we're doing our homework and posting the solicitation in the right places, all of that, right? But there's also, this is a two-way street, right? The companies also have to do their own research to make sure they know what's going on out on the market, right? And, and so the more sophisticated businesses, small or large, Right, can do that. I definitely think you know small companies face some barriers, and 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 that's something that we're looking at. Right, uh, how do we lower the barriers and lower the cost for smaller companies uh, because they may not have all the resources, the business development resources, etc. So again, you know, uh, our goal is, um, you know, our mission is open markets, and so we want to make sure it's an open uh, and fair playing field for everybody. And, and, and so as we uncover some of those barriers, we'll I'll definitely, you know, let you know, so you can make sure that you're not building procurements or doing research in a way that inhibits, you know, uh, anyone from participating if they had, the, had that interest. Um, so uh, Frank, I'm gonna wrap my part up here really quick. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, so I think, I think those were the uh, four key uh, principles again we're gonna pro we may cover some of these in depth even much more so like sources for instance or actually go through an exercise of how you formulate the right questions so we'll come back as part of this series but uh, thank you and I might chime in as Frank goes through a number of these other slides um, but um, um, but we wanted to just cover a couple more topics with you um, that that you know are about starting your research right Great. You know, thanks, Raj. That's, uh, that's great information. And I do appreciate all the, the comments and insights and questions that you all are, are sharing with us and keep them coming. Um, we're going to get through the next couple slides in about 10 minutes or so, and then uh, we'll have some time for questions at the end. But, you know, one of the things I've always said about procurement is if you want to effectively acquire anything, you must understand what you're buying. And that can be easier said than done. Um, a lot of that's due to some of the information asymmetry that Raj described in his story earlier, but it's also because there are just a lot of words that humans use to describe things. And when you're doing market research, it's really important that whatever term you're using to base your search is relevant and it's used by the sellers of those goods and services that you're seeking to buy. Um, so, you know, I, I think, think about it, right? Market research in the information age, you know, we have more information at our fingertips than we've ever had ever, 
I mean, period. Um, and uh, so we can do a lot of great research from our laptops and mobile phones, thanks to Google. But with all that information comes a lot of different ways to describe things. For instance, let's say we have a customer that wants to order surveillance equipment for a new office lease. You know, they're looking to improve building security. Conceptually, I think we can all understand, you know, what that means. That's security cameras, motion sensors, floodlights. But, you know, that might be what I ask the people at Home Depot to sell me if I'm buying personally. But are those the words that the supplier community uses to describe their products? If you don't know the answer, trial and error on Google is a really good way to get started. So, you know, here's a, a Google search screen. I did a basic search for surveillance cameras, government. Uh, I'm not getting, you know, the best results here, but I do, I do see one entry that's, that's helpful um, right there. The third one down government CCTV system, security cameras and video surveillance. Okay. So that tells me right there, that's how industry is describing equipment in the surveillance sector. So I'm kind of refining my keywords through Google search. I'm going to check in chat right here real quick and see if there's any questions. Uh, Anissa, anything to to pause on looks like there's just mostly some back and forth here but yeah i mean i think i think what you're doing when you're doing google research is is a lot of trial and error and you're looking for those those best search and keyword terms that you can that you can use to narrow into your ideal suppliers so cctv systems that's a that's a tactical search term right closed circuit televisions i can use that to find vendors that actually sell those types of systems. I can also find other related search terms at the bottom of every Google search page. I mean, this is an awesome way to find keywords. They'll help you do better market research. And I do some content marketing and so search engine optimization is important. If I write a blog and I wanna make sure people read it, I'm using these searches related to and Google recommendations to come up with the phrases that I know people are looking for. And we're encouraging suppliers and GovShop to do the same thing. How, how are government professionals searching for the products and services that you sell? Don't use jargon if it's not going to be something that somebody uses in a Google search. And for us as buyers, you know, we want to try to, to find the, the things that, that companies are describing, how they're describing their services so we can find them easier. Category codes are another really great source for keywords. I think, uh, you know, category codes, what we're talking about here are product service codes, NAICS codes, NIGP codes, you know, at the federal level, product and service codes, a pretty good system. NIGP codes, I know that's used a lot at, at the state level. I think uh, one code that we're going to be using on GovShop uh, which many of you may be familiar with as UNSPSC, which is the United Nations Standard Product Service Code, uh, which actually has a huge level of detail and actually might help you find some good keywords as well. Nice. And, you know, GovShop isn't, isn't just a database of, of contractors that do business with the government. We also have the category codes uh, mapped in there. So it's, a, it's another great way to, to use GovShop to do some searches for relevant keywords. For example, uh, I want to show you in this, in this next slide, um, continuing our search for surveillance equipment, I actually did a search under NIGP codes for surveillance, and I can see there down at the bottom, you know, code 99080 is surveillance services. So I would be able to use GovShop to, uh, you know, to find some suppliers or more keywords and learn more about what, what's going on in the surveillance industry to improve my market intelligence and buy more effectively. Uh, you can do the same thing in product service codes. So I went back and used uh, security actually as a keyword and I, and I found a specific product service code, code 63 for alarm, signal and security detection. I wanna show you how this actually looks inside of GovShop real quick, just so you can kind of see, um, you know, how effective this tool is. So I'm just gonna move this browser over here. So here's that same, that same screenshot we were looking at for security and product service code 63, more specifically product service code 6350 for miscellaneous alarm signal and security detection systems. I can click right in there and see, excuse me, all of the suppliers that offer 
products and services that are relevant to that. So GovShop's a kind of a neat tool. You know, I can, I can look in here and, and read about what American Systems offers and see if that's a, a supplier that I'm interested in. Uh, and if they are, I can add them to my short list and come back at, during a later session and, um, you know, continue researching that company. So, you know, you can use GovShop to find contractors, but you can also use GovShop to do good keyword research to make your overall market research more effective. You, you know, it's not just product and service and category codes that you want to be doing market research in. You can also look at other available sources. Uh, and what that allows you to do is not only leverage economies of scale, like cooperative buying or, or federal supply schedules, you can leverage economies of scale, but you can also get your goods and services onto contract faster. I think a lot of people are probably familiar with the mandatory sources out there like Nib Nish, National Industries for the Blind, or Ability One. Um, you know, for commodities and certain items is a really good uh, a resource for, um, for purchasing those. But then we also have, you know, the large multi-agency contracts, things like NASA's SOUP program, S-E-W-P, or uh, I think DHS has an Eagle program for, you know, buying um, uh, IT federal supply schedules would fall under that. You know, the GSA schedule is a great resource. And again, it's not just about finding that end supplier to make a purchase from, but it's, it's about reading into those suppliers what they offer and learning how they describe their goods and services. And then of course, cooperating, cooperative purchasing programs, you know, that's where local and state governments can actually pool their requirements together and get better pricing and terms from vendors uh, because of those economies of scale. So do market research on these programs um, and then learn that that's a, I mean, I think somebody asked earlier, you know, how do I learn more about it marketplace? We'll go and read up on, on NASA's soup page. We'll include a link to that, um, you know, in our, uh, in our post event materials. We also have a fantastic directory of some of the more common uh, big Macs and mandatory sources and cooperative purchasing programs that exist. We'll include a link to that as well. And uh, it's, it's hyperlinked. It's a real nice tool that you can use to go and research other uh, uh, contracts that already exist that you can either, you know, use to award contracts quicker or do a little bit additional market research on that. Um, and those, you know, contract vehicles are getting added into GovShop every day. Uh, we, we do have the GSA schedules in there right now. So if I was looking for su surveillance cameras on the GSA schedule, I could easily find, um, you know, a SIN for that. That's a special item number 42645 for surveillance systems, wearable body cameras, and vehicular video. I could go in there right now and pick three suppliers and have them, you know, uh, give them a call and learn about, you know, the industry for surveillance equipment if I wanted to do that. Fantastic. Well, Raj, thank you for, uh, for leading us through this discussion today. I know it was jam-packed of information. We're going to get a recording of the webinar and um, some additional resources put together so we can send out to everyone who attended today. Uh, and uh, again, encourage you to keep your eyes on the NIGP calendar, keep an eye on the public spend form events calendar, because this is just the first webinar in a series of webinars on market research and market intelligence. Um, that's about all I got, uh, Raj, any, any closing thoughts? Do you want to sign us off here? <laughs> sure. Well, uh, thank you again. And, and like I said, uh, come up with those questions, pick up the phone and just start asking away <laughs> or, or keying away, I guess. So, <laughs> and, and thank you. And, uh, I hope you all have a great, I guess, whatever's left, left of the summer. <laughs> thank y'all. Goodbye.